So good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium before Christmas, not of the semester, but before Christmas. And today we're going into the distant reaches of the universe. Uh, I think it's a very topical thing, both from the point of view of direct stellar light, but also the interstellar medium. And here to tell us all about it is Roberto De Carli and his host, Catherine Kreckel, will do the formal introduction. So, um, happy to be introducing uh, Roberto, who is an old friend coming back to visit. So, Roberto did his PhD at Insubria University in Italy, studying black holes and host galaxy masses in quasars. Um, but after that, for eight years, he was here in Heidelberg as a postdoc up at the MPIA. Um, and since 2017, he's been staff at ENAF uh, based in Bologna. And so all of his science is focused on ISM studies of high redshift galaxies, especially in the submillimeter um, through various programs, particularly with ALMA, things like Aspects, and more recently Aspire, and now with JWST. So we'll hear about that today. Thanks. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. It's, it's an immense pe pleasure to be here. I'm very grateful for uh, the invitation, Catherine and the organizers. I, I've been sitting in this auditorium many times, and uh, it's really an honor for me to actually sit on, on the other side. Um, we'll talk about quasars today. This uh, is a, a big uh, a collection of a lot of different results, uh, and I'm very grateful that I've been working with a long list of uh, amazing collaborators that are basically, they did all the work, and here only to summarize what they, they did. Um, just uh, a slide to capture what we are talking about. We are talking about quasars, so uh, creating supermassive black holes. And in particular, uh, we are considering very luminous ones. This is a luminosity versus redshift, and we are talking about high luminosity objects. These are uh, 10 to 46, 47 arc per second objects. And uh, we're talking about the high redshift, where high means above redshift 6, twiddle 6. Um, this is basically uh, everything I will cover uh, today. Um, and uh, just to put everything in a little of a cosmological context, this is the first giga year of the universe. This is a timeline, and for reference, uh, you have the Big Bang here uh, and the uh, different redshifts. Um, and uh, the quasars we know so far are uh, distributed like this. So you have uh, a tail that goes down to a ratio of seven and a half or so. Uh, where uh, it's, the universe is about 700 mega years old. And uh, for uh, comparison, I wanted to show you the, some, some of the basic time scales we consider, uh, consider typically in astronomy. For instance, this is the lifetime along the main sequence of the most massive stars, right? So uh, by ratio of seven and a half, you can have multiple generation of OB stars and perhaps one or two generation of eight, uh, eight up stars, right? But uh, anything less massive than that uh, will not have time to evolve past the main sequence. Um, the, uh, in terms of dynamics, uh, the, the orbit of the sun around the, Milky, in the, around the Milky Way center is about 250 mega years. So again, by redshift uh, seven and a half, uh, a galaxy like the, the Milky Way, the, the sun will only be able to do three flips around the, the Milky Way, right? And uh, if you see, if you think in terms of large scale structures, the crossing time, you can define it as the, you know, the distance that the projectile covered in a, uh, at a given speed. And if you take a one megaparsec and a thousand kilometers per second, it takes about uh, one giga year. Um, so, you know, also the large scale structure will not be resolved, right? And the, the final uh, time scale that is relevant for this discussion is the Salpeter time, which is the e-folding time at which a black, a black hole grows in mass, assuming that it's uh, growing at a fixed uh, radiative efficiency and adding to ratio. And if you assume 0.1 and 0.1 for these two parameters, you get a Salpeter time of 450 mega year. This is a tight constraint, which basically means uh, you, you don't have a lot of time to really grow the black holes. Uh, so uh, the, how do quasars, these massive quasars and, and their host galaxies form? Uh, this is the key question that we try to address, right? So uh, uh, usually what you would do is to take a cosmological simulation, put all the ingredients you know, 
and uh, see what happens. Um, this uh, is uh, ideal, but uh, extremely hard for these black holes. One of the problem uh, is, uh, I think, nicely captured by this uh, uh, beautiful uh, work that Melanie Buzzi and collaborators put together uh, in last year. Uh, this uh, plot show the luminosity and uh, as a function of uh, black hole mass. And um, uh, these are the outputs from uh, some of the most um, uh, famous uh, state-of-the-art cosmological simulation. And uh, the color points here uh, are the population of uh, quasars that these simulations are able to produce by the redshift 6. And the, the cyan point um, to the top right here are the population that we are talking about, the observed population. And you see, top, bottom left is what the simulation predicts, top right is what we observe. So there's a clear limit in the fact that uh, the quasars uh, we, we deal with are extremely rare. There's typically one per cubic gigaparsec, ratio six, um, which means that if you want to have a few of them in your simulation, you need to start with a gigantic volume that is several times this uh, gigaparsec, uh, cubic gigaparsec scale. And then on the top of that, because you want to go to great, great uh, volumes, you need to compromise in uh, resolution. So you will not be able to resolve the, the, the seeding of the black hole. That's something you have to put by hand. You will not be able to resolve how the seed, accrete, the black hole accretes mass. That's also something you have to put with some sub-cell uh, uh, re um, prescription. And then, of course, uh, there's all the complex feedback physics that you have to implement somehow. Now, you can do much better if you do a zoom in simulation. So, you start with a big cosmological simulation and then you just focus on the central halo and uh, see how this evolves. This is uh, an example from, uh, from Alessandro Lupi in collaboration. Um, and uh, these, nice, uh, these, these studies are really nice because uh, they can start to provide a number of constraints like the morphology and the size, the mass of those galaxies. And, the, the uh, ISM condition, uh, abundances, and so on. And they can start to make uh, predictions uh, in terms of what kind of luminosities, for instance, for uh, the far infrared or the C plus uh, emission you, you should expect. And these uh, are th quantities that we, we can directly compare to observations. Um, so since we are close to Christmas, I thought to compile a sort of wish list of what we would like to have from Santa in terms of uh, understanding our uh, formation of high redshift quasars. Well, uh, starting uh, outside and moving in, we want to understand which kind of dark matter halo typically hosts uh, these quasars. Um, we want to understand how the, the galaxy grow through merger um, and uh, which is the, the, the mass uh, budget of those galaxies in terms of dynamical mass, but also how the variants are distributed, stars, gas, and so on. Uh, we want to understand uh, the, the dust mass and temperature and luminosity. This is uh, critical both for the formation of the dust, but also uh, for the general uh, energy budget of these sources. We want to study the, the size, uh, the morphology of the ga those galaxies, the star formation rates, uh, understand something about the physics of the gas and so the metallicity and the, uh, the uh, conditions like density and temperature and so on. And uh, eventually we want to understand the black hole, right? So a lot of things, and we'll try to go quickly through all of this um, to see what is the picture we have now. So let's start with the dark matter halo. Um, all the numerical simulations kind of agree, all the models to explain the formation of the early quasars agree that um, uh, the, the most massive black holes need to reside in massive uh, concentration of matter in the early universe. This is captured in this uh, simulation by Tiago Costa, where basically the, the big circles are the black holes with 10 to the 9 solar masses, and you only find them uh, in the center of this uh, uh, structure that is forming a redshift 6. Uh, although one should keep in mind that might be, there might be large variance uh, among uh, uh, different fields. Um, finding uh, evidence of such overdensities is, uh, not, uh, deep, is not easy. Um, uh, I think the first uh, evidence of such a structure came only three years ago from a study by um, uh, Marco Mignoli and collaborators, where uh, they, uh, after selecting a number of Laman break galaxies shown here in uh, red in the environment of a, um, a quasar redshift 6.3, uh, they managed to uh, confirm that uh, four of them 
have a redshift that is spectroscopic redshift that is consistent with the with the one of the quasar. So it's they are belonging to the same structure, although the separation is a few megaparsec. So this was the, the the first confirmation, and the reason why it came so late and it was so limited in terms of statistics is that doing a spectroscopy of these galaxies is really painful. You get uh, this is the Lyman alpha emissions uh, seen in in these sources. And you see it's a faint line in the middle of all this sky uh, feature that really make the your your uh, life as an observer uh, really miserable. Um, now uh, the big step forward comes from uh, James Webb, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, in particular the near cam instrument, as a um, uh, mode uh, that is the the wide field slitless spectroscopy that basically delivers uh, spectra for uh, everything that is covered in the field. Um, uh, so programs like uh, Spire uh, could use this uh, to secure uh, um, mid infrared uh, uh, spectroscopy in the regime, uh, uh, in this case, three, four micron, um, uh, that basically allows you to cover the oxygen beta, oxygen three and H beta lines uh, at redshift six and a half or so. And um, uh, Aspire covers some 25 quasar fields. Um, and uh, you, you get a spectra like this. So in these plots, you, you see the, uh, the images of the galaxies, and you see the spectrum. And you clearly see these dots here, that just uh, emission lines. And you can easily uh, recognize the oxygen-3 doublet and then, uh, the, the h beta line. Uh, so you have no doubt that this is uh, which uh, lines are these, and uh, you have uh, immediately a measurement of the redshift. And uh, uh, by doing that, uh, uh, they immediately found from one of the first observations, the field of uh, J0305, they found that uh, the quasar that is um, a redshift 6.6 .6, uh, is surrounded by at least 10 uh, galaxies uh, with this uh, oxygen 3 em emission. Uh, so they can start to actually probe the, the structure around the quasar. Um, this is uh, from a similar pro program from the GTO team. It's called uh, Iger. Uh, and uh, uh, again, in this plot where they see separation versus redshift uh, from, uh, from the quasar, they, they identify a number of structures, one uh, at the redshift of the quasar, including uh, some 20 galaxies, uh, one in the foreground and one even in the background. Um, and when you do this for multiple fields, you start to build up statistics. And uh, I tried to summarize this in this plot where you have uh, the, the velocity separation from the quasar and the projected separation. And uh, uh, basically, the, the companion galaxies that we knew before using ALMA or optical spectroscopy are shown in red and orange. And uh, all this uh, ocean of blue points is coming from JWST. So now we're really changing the, the, the field in terms of uh, number of statistics that we can use to uh, probe the, the environment of these quasars. For reference, uh, I compute here the, the, the mass that uh, would basically, is, uh, this, these masses here uh, are basically um, v, um, ro, uh, the distance, the separation v, uh, times v squared divided g. Uh, so it's just to, have, uh, to guide the eye on which kind of masses this, this would be. And uh, of course, uh, when you go to very large separation, these are not uh, really bound systems. This is just a field, right? Uh, but uh, you can tell there is an excess of sources around here. And uh, the preliminary analysis points to halo masses of a few times 10 to the 12 solar masses. Um, although there are some big variations, some, some fields have only a couple of co companion galaxies, some fields have 30. Um, so uh, what happens to these halos if you let them evolve? What, what, what kind of uh, progenitors are, what, what is the, 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 the evolution of these sources? Um, well, uh, if you take uh, some of these halos, and this uh, is something you can try to follow using some analytical model because you can easily compute everything uh, down to redshift zero, um, you see that uh, many of them uh, will become very massive clusters uh, by redshift zero. Perhaps none of, not all of them, and the, there is a big uh, vari variance in the kind of uh, end result of the, the, the mass um, of the, the resulting halo. Uh, all the central uh, galaxies of the, the, the Quisarus galaxy will become very massive. Uh, and uh, basically, irrespective of what kind of uh, feedback and AGN uh, 
uh, in recipes you you adopt uh, all these galaxies will shut down their star formation quickly so, um, so by redshift four maybe uh, two at the latest uh, they run out of uh, gas and they they will appear as a uh, quiescent galaxy in the local universe. Um, so this was for the, the dark matter halos. We'll quickly move to the uh, merger rate. Um, a few years ago, in a study using ALMA, we discovered some of the first, uh, the, the first uh, spectroscopically confirmed companion galaxies around quasars at redshift 6. The, uh, this basically is shown in this plot where I see uh, show the the near infrared con uh, and the, the dust continuum and the, the contours are shown in the C plus. And uh, you see the quasar here and the companion galaxy shown is uh, labeled here as uh, in blue. Um, this was very exciting because, because it was the first time we had the spectra of companion galaxies. Um, uh, if you think that now we have hundreds of them in, that I showed in the previous plot, the, the progress has been pretty uh, tremendous in only a few years. Um, what we see now is a, v a variety in terms of the distribution of distances and the separations uh, in terms of velocity and, and spatial. Uh, uh, you see some uh, 50 kiloparsec separation, but also something that are more connected and even ongoing mergers. Um, uh, roughly about one third of the Quasaros galaxies we, we observe with ALMA in C plus show signs of an ongoing interaction and probably um, uh, or have a companion. So the, this, in a sense, is a lower limit because this is only what we see in, uh, in C+. Plus. There's probably more, but this uh, probably will allow us to, to gauge a bit what is the, 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 the merger rate. Uh, to date, but we will come back to this, uh, there's no conclusive sign of an EGN uh, in the companion galaxy, which would be interesting to see because if you have a merger, uh, uh, that may, of the of the galaxy, maybe you can have uh, 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 the formation of a binary of the two black holes, and maybe coalescence that would that could help uh, the growth of the black holes. But at the moment, uh, we don't have unambiguous evidence for this kind of EGN. Let's move to those galaxies now. So uh, we, thanks to Alma, we can do uh, high resolution uh, uh, observation of C plus. Uh, uh, we already saw some of the maps in the previous slide, but um, here uh, uh, it's a collection by a series of work by Bram Venemans, uh, Mladen Novak, and uh, Marcel Nielman. Each panel you see for a quasar, the dust continuum on the left and the C plus line on the right. And uh, um, uh, these maps have a resolution of uh, order of a kiloparsec. And now we can do this for, you see, this is some 20 galaxies that are uh, probably some 50 quasars, quasaros galaxies that have been uh, observed now with this kind of resolution. And uh, this allows to give us uh, you know, estimates of the dynamical masses. In some cases, we push the resolution even further. These are, are a few examples uh, where the resolution reached uh, 400, 200 parsec regime. And it's really, uh, you know, for someone that works for high, you know, high ratio of galaxies, Having nice maps like this, where you can actually see structures and uh, all the detailed um, geometry and the, this uh, single spiral arm of the quasar, uh, the quasar host that is probably associated with an interaction with a companion, it's really nice that we finally can show some maps that we're proud of. <laughs> and you can get, uh, the, you know, you see, for instance, here you see a, ve a velocity gradient, so the bulk of the galaxy is rotating. But there are also some obvious um, non-rotating component uh, in uh, in the dynamic of the of those galaxies and that might be associated with interaction. So it's really nice that we can really push uh, to to this level of detail. Uh, when you do the modeling, you get uh, dynamical masses that you can compare with, with black hole masses, and you get these points here in uh, in uh, orange and uh, pink. And if you compare these uh, ratios with uh, what you expect from local uh, relationships, you see that uh, on average, they tend to st stay pretty high. So for a given uh, uh, galaxy mass, uh, the, the black holes are uh, overmassive by a factor 10 or so on average. Um, of course, there's a selection effect in this because we tend to select quasars that are very bright. Uh, and uh, the larger the black hole, the easier it is to explain uh, high luminosity. So it might be that we are a bit biased upwards, but uh, the result seems to be confirming most of the cases anyway, even if you relax the luminosity cut. 
Um, moving to other components, besides the dynamical mass, you can try to, to have estimates of uh, what is in these galaxies. And uh, of course, if we talked about dust. You can try to gauge how much dust is in these galaxies. And uh, um, uh, you can try to estimate how much molecular gas is through the, the observation of the carbon monoxide, which is the, the brightest uh, line and one of the most common tracers of molecular gas in high redshift galaxies. Um, but, uh, and we talked about the C plus, uh, the, the line, uh, the fine structure line arising from uh, the single ionized carbon atom, uh, which is very bright and is usually associated with either the skin of the molecular clouds or uh, uh, the ionized medium. But uh, nature provides us also with a uh, bunch of other tracers. Uh, uh, these are all uh, fine structure lines that uh, arise from different regimes, from inside the clouds or uh, from the ionized medium. And uh, you can use uh, a number of them uh, to try to get uh, some information of the different, uh, you know, to, to gauge a bit the different phases. Uh, it's exciting time to do fine structure lines, uh, at least uh, in my perspective. Um, and uh, I think I tried to capture uh, why with this plot, where uh, you see the number of galaxies a ratio larger than one that have one uh, an observation of the fine structure line, uh, and uh, as a function of time, right? And you see that, uh, for instance, the the, uh, the uh, reference point for for us is the the uh, Carilli and Walter review from 2013. It's down here. In the last 10 years, thanks to, in particular, to ALMA, the, the, the sample grows by a factor 10 or more, right? So it's, uh, now you really have a lot of statistics to play with. Um, this is, again, the same data, but shown in a line, a luminosity versus uh, um, a redshift. You see all these color points. These are all galaxies with different uh, traces, with different lines. And you can use uh, these kind of traces to study the um, the physics of the ASM in these galaxies. Uh, this is the same plot breaking down in different uh, transitions. And uh, here I add uh, the, the gray lines uh, are uh, the five sigma sensitivity limit you get with uh, one hour of integration with ALMA. Just to show you that uh, this is accessible and it's not that expensive. ALMA can do these kind of observations, even at very high ratio. Um, so we did that with uh, at least one quasar we did uh, uh, a survey of different uh, line transitions. So we have uh, uh, the nitrogen, uh, the ionized nitrogen, ionized ox oxygen, a uh, bunch of molecular lines uh, um, from CO, from water, uh, uh, the OH, uh, um, and uh, for free we got a nice sampling of the dust SCD. And uh, uh, you can use basic the recipes to estimate how much mass is associated with all of these elements. And uh, you see we have order 10 to the 9 solar mass in dust and uh, the different uh, uh, ions here. And uh, if you correct for the abundance that you expect for this galaxy, you get uh, this level of, uh, you know, um, some a few times 10 to the 10 uh, solar masses uh, in both ionized and molecular gas in the host galaxy of this quasar. For reference, the dynamical mass of this galaxy is the order of uh, a few times 10 to the 11, but um, there is a big uncertainty because uh, it's a rotating disk, but it's almost in phase on, so there's a big uh, inclination correction, and that's a bit uh, un uh, uncertain. But you know, uh, huge concentrations of gas, right? Um, of course, we talked about gas, you want to study also stars. But uh, uh, detecting the host galaxy uh, starlight uh, is a pain. We tried uh, as a community a lot with HST in the past, but uh, you always end up with uh, maps like this. After you remove the PSF that uh, is uh, uh, associated with the quasar, you uh, only have ugly residuals and nothing else. Um, and this is a uh, limitation due to surface brightness, uh, to the contrast against the bright nucleus, uh, reddening uh, and the compact sizes. So if the host galaxy is very compact, uh, all the emission is basically concentrated within the PSF, and you cannot tell it from apart from the uh, the nucleus. Of course, JWST. The big hope with JWST is, was that we could circumvent most of these limitations uh, because it's much more sensitive, and uh, you're observing uh, further to the red, so there's less contrast against the nucleus. 
um, and indeed uh, it delivered. Uh, these are, uh, uh, this is one example uh, uh, in two different filters. They observed this quizzer in, uh, in a paper by Ding and collaborators. And you see that after uh, you take the data, you remove the PSF, you end up with some extended uh, residuals that are clearly um, uh, broader than the, the PSF. So there's no doubt that in this case, they actually saw the starlight emission from those galaxies. So great, uh, but uh, they smartly, the uh, Ding and collaborator observed the quiz that are relatively faint. Compared to most of the quiz that I'm talking about, which are here, they are a factor 100 fainter. So um, in a sense, this was uh, a bit easier because the contrast was less brutal than in some other quizzes. Um, and this is another example uh, from another paper that appeared by, by Meredith Storm and collaborators when, uh, where I show the, um, uh, the radial uh, light profile. So how much uh, the surface brightness is a function of radius um, in different filters for five different quasars observed with JWST. And uh, in blue, you see the light profile of the quasar. And in red, you see the light profile of uh, a model star, which is the, your reference PSF. And if you can't tell apart the, the red and the blue line, that's exactly my point. Even with JWST, this is going to be extremely difficult. And in some cases, we don't detect those galaxies, the, the starlight emission from those galaxies. Moving on to dust. Uh, so I already showed you this plot. Um, we have a nice sampling of the dust, and you can try to model it and uh, infer parameters like the temperature, in this case, around 47 Kelvin. Uh, the dust mass is 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, and then uh, infrared luminosity and the optical opacity. Um, and the 10 to the 9 is a lot uh, in terms of dust mass. Um, and to understand that, uh, I show you this plot from the review by Schneider and Maiolino, uh, where uh, you see different uh, mechanisms to produce dust. And you see that even in a relatively high metallicity environments, uh, in the most optimistic case, you get uh, that basically you, you create uh, a uh, um, stellar mass, uh, a mass of a solar mass, sorry, of dust uh, every 1,000 solar masses of stars. So uh, you're not really efficient in forming stars. You need to form a lot of, uh, sorry, in forming dust. You need to form a lot of stars in order to explain the dust. And uh, just with this estimate, it means that if you start with 10 to the 9, you need uh, some. Uh, several 10 to the 11 uh, stars to form right in your galaxy. So we might not see the stars uh, because the, of the problems I showed before, the contrast with the nucleus and so on. But we know there must be a lot, uh, a, a hefty stellar population in, in these host galaxies. Um, coming to the temperature, I showed you that we reached, in this case, uh, basically the peak of the, uh, the dust emission. This is not the only case. This is a, a, a few other examples from a, a paper that my former student, Antonio Pensabene, uh, wrote. Um, and you see that basically all the SEDs look pretty much the same. We have temperatures of typically 40 to 60 Kelvin. We don't go to very high temperatures uh, in the dust emission. In, in, in no case, we have observed much higher temperatures than this. Um, so we, we say there's a lot of dust. Uh, it's very compact systems, and this uh, has a direct implication uh, that basically, um, if you assume a, uh, some basic geometry of those galaxy, uh, the the central AGN must be highly obscured uh, along many different uh, line of sight. Not only by the molecular torus that we typically assume in the, around the central engine of the of the AGN, in you know the type one, type two kind of. Uh, classification, but also by a significant uh, obscuration coming from the, the interstellar medium of the host galaxy, on much larger scales. And uh, indeed, with some basic uh, estimates on sizes and uh, column densities, uh, uh, Gillian collaborator found that uh, you can easily get uh, a fraction of obscured AGN that are as high as 80% uh, or even higher um, at a ratio larger than 6. So it might be that uh, the, the bulk of the population for this, uh, this high redshift, uh, the bulk of the EGN population is actually obscured, and we haven't observed it yet. Moving to morphology and size. Uh, so I already showed this slide where we have a lot of uh, 
um, uh, uh, mass of uh, maps of uh, gas and uh, dust in the host galaxies of the quasars. And if you compare the sizes, you see that uh, the gas, as traced by C plus, is typically more extended than the dust. And uh, th um, that say the, the dust distribution is usually very compact. It's all within two uh, kiloparsecs, except these uh, red points here, which uh, are all objects in which we see an interaction uh, of the host galaxy. So the host galaxy is probably interacting or uh, mixed with the companion galaxies. This, uh, and the interaction makes it appear larger. But um, uh, other than that, the typical host galaxy is very compact. Star formation rate. Uh, we have all this nice sampling of the dust emission, so we can assume this is mostly powered by you, uh, the, the, you know, the, the young stars uh, that are uh, producing a lot of UV photons. They're, uh, he he they're heating the dust. And uh, the luminosities we get are uh, typically between 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, which immediately tells you that the star formation rates are high, hundreds of solar masses per year in the typical uh, Quasarus galaxy. Um, so this is using the dust. The dust, uh, usually the tracing star formation rate on time scale of a few hundred mega years. Uh, you can also do uh, use different approaches. Uh, we said we have uh, different lines like oxygen-3. Oxygen-3 is, uh, you know, in order to photoionize uh, um, uh, oxygen to ice, uh, you need the secondary energy is, uh, is pretty high. You need uh, very massive stars, very hot stars, uh, which are very short-lived. After 10 mega years, they're gone. So in a sense, uh, it's um, uh, oxygen-3 could be used as a tracer of the more instantaneous star formation rate. And uh, uh, if you use, and we observe oxygen three in some of these galaxies, and uh, indeed we can get an estimate, assuming that all the star, the the photoionization that is responsible to produce this oxygen three line is uh, coming from uh, star formation. From star formation, uh, it could be that there's a contamination by the AGN, but as far as we can tell, uh, the the line ratios that we observe uh, for quasars and non quasar environments seem to be uh, pretty much aligned with uh, you know what happens with the local uh, um, uh, infrared luminous galaxies, as shown in this plot by in a paper that Fabian wrote uh, a few years ago. So, uh, to first order, it's realistic to think that uh, the oxygen three is mostly associated with star formation. Of course, uh, in the local universe, when uh, you want to talk about star formation, you really don't want. Uh, uh, to go through oxygen three, but you really want to observe uh, H alpha. And now, thanks to James Webb, we have that. So uh, I will talk more about this system in a second. But what you see here, uh, the contours are the C plus uh, emission from ALMA tracing uh, the, the reservoir of gas. And what you see in, uh, in, uh, in the color scaling in, in purple is the H alpha emission in this quasar that is interacting with the, with the two companion galaxies. So now we can do even direct measurement of uh, star formation rate via the H alpha line. So this brings me naturally to the next point, the uh, metallicity and the gas physics. So uh, this system that I just introduced uh, was discovered uh, in 2017 using ALMA. We have the Quasaros galaxy, which is basically this vertical structure, and it's interacting with the um, two companion galaxies, uh, one to the east, one to the west. Uh, this is the, our nice uh, ALMA map. The, the companion galaxies are also seen in the UV, uh, in the rest frame UV using HST. So we have no doubt that these are galaxies with uh, st some st uh, star formations, uh, stars that we see in the rest frame UV. And there's also a huge Lyman Alpha nebula surrounding this system um, that we mapped with the VLT Muse. So uh, we did a follow-up with near spec in IFU, and we get uh, this nice map uh, uh, after removing the PSF of the quasar. You see this is uh, in uh, H-alpha, H-oxygen-3, and H-beta in the three channels. You see uh, we could trace the host galaxy of the quasar. This is sort of a, 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 a plume that is extending towards the Lyman alpha halo, which is the, uh, we interpret as an outflow. And we see that this part here is the Eastern Companion, the Western Companion here. It's really beautiful that we can now map, not only detect these lines, but we map them on a resolved scale 
in a system at redshift 6.2. You can play the games like uh, putting these uh, different regions of this system on a BPT diagram, as in this case. Um, this is the Western Companion, the Eastern Companion, the parts of the uh, the system more closer associated with the with the Earth galaxy, and uh, and you can even map the line ratios. Right, this is a, a nitrogen over each alpha, and you see already from this plot that. Uh, the condition the uh, uh, for for the Eastern Companion, the Western Companion are different. Uh, you also see that the value of nitrogen over H alpha here are, is very low. So basically, this automatically rules out the presence of an EGN there. Uh, while uh, the, the excitation condition for the um, Eastern Companion seem to be a bit dependent on the photoillumination from the quasar, uh, you can play the same game with the helium, uh, oxygen 3 over each beta, and then infer other quantities. For instance, we have the two of Balmer line, each alpha and each beta, and you can take the ratio and get uh, the, the Balmer decrement and check uh, how the, the extinction you see uh, and compare it with the, the contours here that are uh, the, the mapping, uh, showing the, the dust emission um, that we mapped with ALMA. And it's very nice to see, for instance, that the Western Companion is. Uh, Fairly poor in dust, and indeed, it's not much. Uh, there's not so much extinction. Uh, conversely, the the eastern companion is much. Uh, it's a bit brighter in the dust, and it's in, indeed more obscure. Um, so it's really nice because now finally we can get an insight of on the the you know, physical properties, metallicity, temperature, and so on in the uh, interstellar medium for this galaxy. It's really mind blowing that we can do this at ratio six. Moving to the last point, black holes. Uh, so in the in the past, we were uh, um, uh, using mostly ground-based uh, spectroscopy using uh, uh, eight-meter class telescopes uh, to secure uh, spectroscopy of uh, some of the broad emission lines in the rest frame UV. In this case, the magnesium line from a, a, a series of paper by Manuele Farina and Chiara Mazzucchelli and others. Um, and you see that uh, the, you have this uh, broad emission line that is associated with gas in uh, just orbiting around the black hole. And this was used to infer the black hole mass. Uh, and uh, we were getting the black hole masses that we mentioned before. This is a plot of luminosity versus black hole mass. And you see that uh, compared to the, the gray points, which, is, which are the, the, the quasar from uh, Sloan, the low ratio quasar from Sloan, um, you see that we typically get uh, masses of a few times 10 to the 8, uh, up to a few, several times 10 to the 9 solar masses, and luminosities of uh, 10 to the 46, 47 uh, Earth per second. Um, now, uh, there was uh, the caveat that we always use uh, rest frame UV lines, which are not ideal to probe the, the mass of a black hole. And uh, um, um, all the calibrations that we have in the local universe are relying on Balmer lines, the broad H alpha, broad H beta. Uh, and now, again, with the JWST, you can actually measure them. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the spectrum of, uh, of the quasar. For, uh, for which I showed you the, the few data that uh, we, we, we talked about before. Um, and uh, my, my postdoc, Federica Loiacono, um, modeled this uh, and got uh, you know, a beautiful fit uh, of the broad emission lines. I really want to stress, this is not a template. This is the actual data. We have a signal to noise of like 300 in some, uh, per pixel in, in these observations. So it's, really mind-blowing the level of um, things you can do with JWST now. Um, uh, when you compare the masses, this is the mass we get from uh, the Balmer lines versus the one uh, of the, that we had derived from uh, magnesium. You see that basically there's uh, the two things that work fairly well together. There might be a factor two offset uh, depending on the calibration you use, but basically this is not really changing the picture. These black holes are 10 to the 9 solar masses, uh, no matter how you measure them, um, which poses the problem how they grew um, uh, so fast in such a short time. Uh, here you have the log of the black hole mass as a function of time. Uh, now it's a reverse direction compared to the plot I started the talk with, but uh, um, basically, if you're assuming that the accretion is uh, 
um, at a fixed adding to rate uh, and a fixed um, um, uh, relative efficiency uh, in this log linear plot, uh, the, the growth of the black hole is a straight line. And uh, you see that you go back in time and uh, uh, you need to start with fairly massive black hole if you want to uh, explain the population of the Rashif seven and a half quasars that we have here, right? Um, so uh, the, in the, the, basically the net result here is that uh, either uh, the black holes indeed started fairly massive, several 10 to the four, maybe 10 to the five or 10 to the six solar masses, uh, as you see, it's a pretty high redshift, or uh, you need to change the slope of this line. And how you do you change it? It's either you play with the radiative e efficiency, or uh, you allow the growth to be super adding on in some uh, in some short times. Um, and of course, uh, from uh, this plot, it's fairly clear that uh, the more uh, uh, the tighter constraints on the model come uh, from the very uh, you know if we manage to push. Uh, this to to higher and higher redshift, right? Uh, but this is difficult uh, because we say the black holes tend to stay, these quasars tend to stay in uh, uh, halos of 10 to the 12, a few times 10 to the 12, right? The solar masses. So you take from the cosmology, this is as no, no astrophysical content, it's just cosmology. You take uh, the, um, um, the mass function of uh, dark matter halos, uh, redshift six, and uh, for for uh, a halo of ten to the few times ten to the twelve, you go, you look what happens at redshift nine. You go down by three orders of magnitude. So we know some five hundred quasars uh, at redshift six. Uh, now let's say there is a thousand in the sky. Uh, if you drop by a factor, uh, you know, a thousand, it means that at redshift nine there should be one in the whole sky, right? Um, and uh, this evolution seems to match uh, what we start to see in the evolution of the luminosity function. This is uh, a plot by a recent paper by uh, Max Walk and collaborators. Um, and uh, of course, the ideal would, would be to have a large uh, um, survey covering a lot of sky um, in the near infrared. And this is exactly what uh, Euclid is, uh, is designed for, right? And uh, this is a prediction of uh, how many quasars you expect to find as a function of redshift uh, with Euclid. And you see that when you go down to redshift nine or so, uh, if everything goes well, we might find one. Then, uh, of course, uh, Euclid will be instrumental to really push the populate, populate all this uh, intermediate redshift regime. I don't want to be to pass the message that uh, Euclid will only give this one quasar, but it will be incre incredibly powerful to constrain models. So concluding, uh, we had a pretty long uh, list of uh, you know, wish list of things we l wanted to learn. And I think uh, it, it's uh, extremely exciting to see that uh, we are kind of getting there, right? We have uh, constrained observation and constraint of basically pretty much all of these uh, points. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, this uh, next few years are going to really change our understanding of quasars. This, most of the things I showed are based on a few preliminary results, but uh, in a few years, these are, uh, this will be well established uh, on a statistical ground. I think it's going to be extremely exciting to see how this evolves. And with this, I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Roberto. Uh, truly astounding, this wealth of information. Um, I'm sure we have lots of questions to ask you about that. Um, I'll start with the floor, but if, if people online would like to make a question, please uh, type in to the um, chat that you'd like to do so. So questions from the floor, please. Lots of hard thinking going on. Can I ask an initial question? You've got this wealth, this very impressive wealth of emission lines in the, in the rest frame, prime infrared, submillimeter. Um, what other physical parameters about the interstellar medium can you infer from that? You mentioned um, some of them, but um, I'm thinking things like, you know, basic things like pressure, density, um, and, and a, a sort of associated question to what extent. Uh, 
are you seeing things which are star forming uh, 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 powered by photon fields from from star formation or to what extent are you seeing things to do with accretion phenomena uh, associated with the quasar in in a, in, in terms of the host dialysis? Mm -hmm. yeah uh, thanks a lot for the question because that i think i have the perfect slide to answer um so this is one of these figures you put together for the for proposals and uh, where you show the power of combining alma and james webb right um uh, as a matter of fact, uh, we have a number of uh, tracers that we can use to measure, for instance, the electron density. Um, the, the best example, I would say, is the, the, the two nitrogen lines at uh, 122 and 205 micron. Um, it's the same element, the same ionization, so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, other, um, you know, relative abundances or anything. And the only difference is that uh, the critical density is different. So uh, this makes them the ratio a very powerful indicator of the the density. And if you combine that with some uh, temperature uh, um, estimate, uh, you, then you can start to play with you know pressure or other parameters. You have uh, dynamical information that can give you the you know how puffed up uh, are the disks. Of course, we're talking about optimistically you can do that on a kiloparsec scale. It will be a bit expensive to do this on on much higher uh, angular resolution and uh, but uh, if you are happy to deal with uh, you know uh, global kiloparsec scale uh, properties within galaxies uh, we we will get there to, to get this kind of information okay um i noticed i, I noticed these lines are basically um uh, you know photo dissociation regions with with um mm -hmm. hard Sources. Um, I did notice that you had a CO line uh, seven to eight or something like yes, that, yes. Um, which of course might might what would mean very dense, very warm gas. Is that something you would put together with the AGN, or is that something you might even expect with star formation regions? Because I, I mean, the physical conditions might be very different in the star formation in yes. in, in the birth clouds in the star formation region. So, you know, can can you distinguish between the the black hole? So region and the star formation also in these in these uh, molecular tracer lines. Yes, yeah. in the molecular tracer, I think uh, seven to six is a bit in, in, uh, on the edge. It's a bit difficult to in, to interpret by itself. But if you go to even higher J, and in some case of this quasar, we detect the CO ten to nine or even higher J. So in these cases, the fact that, that there is a an a, an an XDR kind of regime where a, a significant input of X ray radiation possibly associated with the IGN is uh, it's much easier to to explain that kind of uh, um, CO's led right so you could do it uh, with uh, with uh, with uh, molecular gas traces um of course the more the happier uh, right so the merrier so you if you can get uh, also other tracers like water um uh, it will allow you to discriminate between uh, uh, the the density the very high density regime uh, and uh, actually a, a hard uh, excitation uh, source uh, a hard um, uh, photo source that is ex exciting the gas right so if you put together different tracers probably you get a okay. even better understanding of the, the physics okay thanks very much okay and another question so okay um i'll just one more in the hall before i come to the online audience there's one question here Thanks very much for the nice talk, Roberto. I had a question about your plot where you show the accumulating wealth of fine structure lines that are now um, observed, you know, in the in the recent years. I remember from the review from Carilli and Walter that there was a few deciding moments, right? Alma coming online, et cetera, that were really driving this. I saw a big jump now around 2018, 2019. Can you say what was the, the thing that changed this? I, I think so. A few big projects came out uh, around that time, right? Uh, Alpine was uh, an example. Uh, uh, there, there was the aspects, so some C, C1 is from there. Um, uh, our survey of C plus uh, from uh, for the high ratio quasars was also from 2018. So that was uh, part of the boost in terms of uh, numbers. Um, I, I think in terms of if you want a more, uh, you know, giving a little perspective. 
uh, Alma was in full swing around 2012, 2013, and then, uh, you know, uh, in the first few years, uh, it was easier to do smaller projects with a few objects. Uh, by 2015, 16, people start to be a bit more ambitious and say, okay, now we can do 20 sources, 30 sources, or 50, and that really boosted the statistics. Then. Okay, um, now I'd like to, before I go back to the hall here, I'd like to let Hans Zinnecke ask a question from the um, remote audience. So I'll attempt to get, get you on the microphone here. Right, can you speak up, Hans? Yeah, I can, if you hear me. Okay, I don't hear you, so I'm going to read out your question, Hans. Oh, you um, can't hear me. So Hans is asking, okay. you mentioned that the Quasar companion galaxies don't seem to have massive black holes. That's surprising. What are the detection limits on black holes in the companion galaxies? Oh, so very good question. They, uh, so we can tell there is a black hole only basically if it's active, right? Uh, at this point, we don't have the resolution to resolve, especially in the companion galaxies, to resolve the sphere of influence and to tell uh, from a dynamical information if there is a quiescent black hole. Uh, so. The only hope to see them is that if they are accreting. Um, uh, then if they are accreting, the need, the problem is to find traces that show uh, the, the impact of the AGN, right? Um, the usual way we could do it in the local universe is using the BPT diagram and similar diagnostics. Um, the problem is that typically the, the BPT diagram takes advantage of the fact that uh, you are typically in a relatively high metallicity scenarios when you're observing an AGN. So that uh, allows the two wings of the, the BPT diagram to, to spread, right? Um, in a, at high redshift, it's possible that some of these host galaxies are not so metal rich. And so you basically suppress the nitrogen and everything shifts to the left, right? So it will be a bit more complicated to distinguish um star formation from AGN uh, but then you might try to rely on other tracers like helium 2 uh, helium 2 has a high ionization energy so if you see a high helium 2 over each beta you can think that's probably a tracer of uh, uh, an indication there's an AGN right so the hope is to combine different tracers like this and and uh, and the hope of course, if you see the broad emission lines from this is also, a, you know, a, the smoking gun of an AGN. But uh, uh, in none of these cases uh, that I presented, we have clear indication of that. Okay, Hans, I hope that answers your question. If you want to come back, then type in again. But in the meantime, I'll go to the next question from the audience. Oh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about the black hole masses, your last point. Um, and, and was just trying to assess how far we are in getting a problem. Um, I mean, it depends critically on these parameters. I think the most, the parameter that has most effect is this epsilon parameter, this efficiency, which, which um, for low spin black holes can become low, right? And so, yeah. um, so that, that would change the slope quite a bit. If you change a factor two, the slope would go in this thing with factor two, right? Because it is exponential, just right. I mean, the other thing is you, you really only can only see similarly only sensitive to these very big things. And so you, you see the tip of the iceberg and yes. presumably everything that, I mean, what I expect is that there's a few lucky black holes that, that happen to accrete more or less all the time at that rate, more or less. And that's what you see. The most, the most black holes don't do this. So that's why, you know, in the companions, you, you may have one, but you don't see them. So is that borne out by the data? So, um... Very good point, both of them. So starting with the second one, uh, it's true that uh, here there will be a, a population of less massive black holes that uh, are more representative of the bulk of the population. The thing is that uh, most of model will not have a problem to explain their, their presence. Uh, we go for the extreme cases because that's where you hit the breaking point of the model. Right? You you force the model to the... Yeah, but if you go to the extreme with... cases, the model is allowed to do anything. The model is allowed to do... <laughs> to go for the crazy ways. And, and so I'm, I mean, this is exactly the point, you know, if, if I can still manage to get the hole there from a, you know, from a, from a sun, uh, from some, from a star, from a hundred solar mass or 200 solar mass yeah. star, that, then, then no problem. I mean, 
because you go to these extreme cases. I can, I mean, in, plan, in order to play devil advocates, you have to be strong. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Right. So the uh, you, you can play with the, the parameters. You uh, one argument uh, maybe is that uh, um, you can uh, imagine you have uh, a lot of uh, you know different uh, uh, phases of uh, rapid super adding tone accretion, and then uh, uh, you know the black hole shuts down, but not completely, and then uh, it starts again, and that will make the the slope uh, steeper. Or you can play with the radiative efficiency. And there are a number of models where uh, the puffed up accretion disk will basically allow to get more, uh, more uh, material uh, and to shield a bit the rest of the material from, uh, from the feedback, basically from the radiation feedback, uh, which would also help uh, in keep getting much, much um, faster growth of the black hole. Um, the counter argument, if you, in a sense, is that the phenomenology of the quasars, uh, if you saw the, 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 the spectrum, right, that's remarkably similar to what uh, you typically observe in, in any slow and quasar redshift one, right? And uh, you don't see this extreme uh, fluctuation in, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, accretion rate. Uh, um, you don't see, and you can do it with Sloan with the millions of quasars, right? Uh, so it's strange uh, that uh, uh, you have a mechanism that works uh, only for the redshift six population. It produces the right high redshift, the, the, the supermassive black holes there, and then uh, doesn't work anymore, but the phenomenology of the quasar is the same, right? The, you, you have the spectra, right? Uh, you can tell, uh, you, you see the, 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 the SED, the, the, the emission lines that you see in the spectra, both in the optical and the UV, they're very consistent, right? There are differences, but there are minuscule differences that are uh, not really explaining this, uh, this kind of variation. So you are basically invoking a new, a different way to accrete the black holes, and then uh, you don't need it anymore <laughs> at redshift one. But that seems to be inconsequential for the general look of the agent. That's the, the main counter argument. But, you know, it might be that it's a very, very rapid phase and we don't see it yeah. after. Well, Nature does very, very strange things. And we'll discuss that further yeah. over dinner, I suspect. Yeah. Um, for the moment, let's go on to the next question from the hall. And I'll get back to the online audience after that. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk. So. If you look at let's say let's shift zero and the black hole mass to bulge mass ratio, so that seems to I mean there seems to be a good agreement between simulations and observations. Do you agree with that? I'm not sure I understand what is the question. If I agree so, with the fact so, that no, no, I think I mean, okay. So if you agree, what I think is that if you look at redshift zero, then black holes grow massive enough. Yeah. When we are at redshift zero, right? But they are not massive enough as in simulations at redshift six. So this seems that what's happening, I mean, the, the overall growth of black holes through like the whole cosmic time is correct. However, the time in the cosmic epoch that the growth is happening is wrong. Right. So it, yes, it, that might be the case. The, the, the thing is that uh, um, I think at that stage you, you get into uh, some circularity in the way you model the feedback. Uh, uh, and the, the you know general evolution of the galaxy, which okay. is an open issue, but to some extent, yes, you're correct. Okay, so so if we, we grow black holes very massive relative six, then something should prevent them from growing even more massive than what we observe relative zero, right? So between relative six and relative zero, something should kind of slow down the growth comparing to what we yeah. have in current cosmological simulations. Yeah. So could that be like itself, let's say, black of feedback that kind of... Yeah, yeah. Right, so, M MC so is the... In other words, uh, the black holes have been growing like this. Uh, why don't they keep on growing? Uh, we don't get the uh, 10 to the 13 yeah. solar masses black hole at shift zero. I think the point is that the galaxy star at some point, right? You, you The black hole uh, is creating a lot, is becoming extremely luminous and starting to do a lot of feedback in the surrounding. The host galaxy is forming stars and burning the reservoir of gas at a very high pace. And uh, 
you know, the, this system uh, at very early units uh, are extremely efficient, uh, but then at some point they run out of material. They run out of gas that they can uh, use to, to grow. So star formation will stop uh, and uh, the, those galaxies will become a, a massive elliptical galaxy and the black hole will stop uh, growing. Okay, so as a simulator, if I want to try to... Okay, in simulations, then we should try to grow more massive black holes that to restrict and then try to prevent more massive uh, at ratio of zero. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, the mystery of feedback has even more unexplored dimensions. That's something very interesting to learn. Just on my way down here to see if there are any more questions. And I'd first of all like to um, read out what Hans Zingenecker said in response to your answer to his question. Thank you. What is your favorite model for the rapid growth of the black hole masses? Oh, I don't have a favorite model. I, I, so uh, I had a very, very interesting uh, conversation yesterday with uh, Ralph Klassen right. that uh, really uh, he shared some of the, the latest re results. So. I was very skeptical of the the classic. So the two models that are usually, uh, you know, simplistically presented are one is the creation of a popul a population three stars. So uh, the remnants of uh, very massive metal poor galaxies could be fairly massive, like hundred solar masses or so. This is this uh, this shade here, uh, and the other is the the direct collapse black hole. That basically you take a very big cloud of gas, you prevent uh, prevent the cloud to fragment, to cool, to, to fragment and form stars. And then at some point it becomes uh, a directly a, a black hole just out of uh, self-gravity. Uh, in the um, vanilla version of the direct collapse, uh, you really need uh, extremely specific conditions to prevent uh, the fragmentation. So I've heard um, um, models where they have the gas cloud and the companion galaxies is providing some UV radiation to, to basically keep on uh, preventing the, the cooling of the gas. Uh, but at the same time, the galaxy should not do any outflow because if you start to get metals in the, the cloud, you're done. So uh, you really need to play with the condition very accurately. And that was never particularly fascinating. Um, the, the model that we discussed with Ralph was much more uh, flexible and it would not uh, require so strict condition for the gas cloud because even uh, if uh, there's some star formation ongoing, as far as the growth of the seed is, is uh, the accretion is, is rapid, which would not be a big problem in this very high, rich, uh, high uh, gas rich systems. Uh, then uh, you could keep on uh, the the this uh, sort of proto black holes uh, uh, growing um, uh, until everything collapses. So uh, maybe Raph was extremely efficient in convincing me that it's fascinating and could work. Uh, I would go for with that for the moment. Hmm? Wait, wait, wait! Say it again. Yeah, I think you can keep on what growing angular argument? momentum, right? I, I, it's, it's a question you should ask Ralph. <laughs> okay, okay. I've learned well, about it yesterday. I haven't digested. Well, Ralph's not here at the moment, but we'll certainly ask him and maybe uh, yes. bring him up here to explain in, in a larger format at some stage what he's actually going on about there. Um, but I think we've now finished with our time, and I have to thank you very much on the audience, first of all, for such an interesting um, discussion. Before we thank Roberto, I'd also like to make a couple of announcements. So it just reminds me to thank Roberto for this very informative, uh, very, very interesting overview of all these fantastic observations. We wish you all the best uh, in, in sort of unraveling these mysteries further in the future, both observationally and through your interactions with all the in, in the community. But thank you very much for this colloquium. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you.